Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depends where you are situated. I welcome you to our seminar, Social Movements in Africa, Mobilization in the Middle of a Pandemic. Especially, I would like to welcome our excellent speakers of today, Turisile Nirongo, Ruth Mombi, Ario Dare Atoye, and Mohamed Saidi Khan. Later on, they will be properly introduced who introduced themselves. And at this point, thank you very much for being with us and sharing your expertise. Warm greetings also to the audiences, both those who are participating via Zoom, as well as those who are joining uh, via Facebook. The webinar is organized by the Vienna Institute for International Dialogue and Cooperation and Africans Rising. This is a Pan-African Network for Justice, Peace, and Dignity. You will learn more about Africans Rising during our webinar. The VIDC is a Vienna-based uh, think and tool tank, how we say, in the fields of international dialogue, cultural exchange, and anti-discrimination. And my name is Frank Schmidiel, and I'm in charge of the VADC Africa Policy Desk. Uh, I would like to thank Africans Rising for the excellent cooperation. It's the first one we are doing. And also thanks goes to the Austrian Development Corporation for their financial support, as well as to our, to our colleagues, to my colleagues for their technical assistance. Now two technical remarks. Uh, you will be invited, the audience will be invited to participate via the Q&A section. And second, the conference will be recorded. Uh, why we are doing this event? We think that such transnational, transcontinental events are very important, uh, especially the subject of today, nonviolent protest movements and their struggles for political transition, for social transitions, have a very strong local and national reference. But there is also a transnational, international, transcontinental dimension. Uh, for example, solidarity or cooperation with the diaspora. But another uh, current example, during the ongoing post Cotonou negotiations and the debates about the future of uh, African-European relations, the role of civil society is discussed very controversially. But it seems, again, the negotiators will find, a, I would say, a, a compromise under breaks, brackets, which can be called civil society should engage themselves only as service provider because developmental NGOs are needed, uh, especially in the sectors where the neoliberal state, state failed. But another role which social movements have, these movements that demand domestic accountability, or like we will hear the end of police brutality, not only on the African continent, also in, in, in America and Europe, uh, when, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, movement. Uh, and these social movements that are the drivers for social transformations, they are not included in this African-European dialogue. Uh, one reason might be that the ruling elites see them, see us as a threat. And therefore, we are, we are very much interested to listen today to your stories and your analysis. Unfortunately, it's not possible uh, face to face but uh, at least via internet. And yeah, now I would like to hand over to our moderator. Rita Isiber is a communication expert, trainer, facilitator, and founder of African European Partners, an agency based in Vienna. Before, Rita worked for different national international institutions in the UK, but also in West Africa. 
Well, thank you, Rita, for chairing this webinar. And I wish you all an inspiring and interesting debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz, for introducing the subject of discussion today. Now, a very warm welcome to an insightful discussion on mobilizing social movements in the middle of a pandemic. Now, our focus, as Franz mentioned, is on Africa. We are delighted to have you and others tuning in from different parts of the world via Zoom and Facebook to join this advocative initiative brought by the VIDC and the Africans Rising Movement. So our mission for this meaningful dialogue is to help improve your understanding of the protests and citizens' resistance, particularly in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Kenya. So it will be very interesting to know what motivates our brave speakers today that risk their lives to fight for a better world. Now, in order to keep the next hour as interactive and informative as possible, I'd like to weave in your thoughts during the discussion with our invited activists today. So you have a chance to share your questions and ideas, and we encourage you to use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And on Facebook, you can just post some of your statements or questions that you have or that you would like me to mention on your behalf. But also, we may invite one or two of you, um, providing you raise your hand during the Q&A session, to voice your own questions. Now, on to the serious part. Last I checked, coronavirus cases have passed beyond 53 million infected people worldwide. Remarkably, the reported death rates, death rates in Africa have been consistently low compared with Europe and other parts of the world. Now, earlier this year, in June, the VIDC Global Dialogue brought together a group of health experts which discussed COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. I recommend you to watch that particular discussion on VIDC YouTube or Facebook. It was a really informative discussion. In reference of the World Health Organization, I can list a few reasons why Africa has managed to cope better during COVID-19 pandemics. So, for example, 60% of the African population is under 25 years old. Then there's an expertise in epidemic control. And you also need to take into consideration that there is low travel between the borders. And then, of course, you know, the hot climate also encouraged the population to spend their lifestyle largely outdoors. This may sound wonderful. However, these opportunities are also bringing consequences um, of the pandemic. Some African countries suffer injustice, in inequality, and weak public institutions. The governments in Africa are punishing millions of people by cutting off financial assistance or attacking peaceful protesters and killing several of them. So the question is, how will the pandemic reshape power structures within communities and within societies? What are the lessons learned? So our discussion today features four inspirational activists and human rights defenders who will risk their lives to share their inspirational stories with us. So also, this is a brilliant opportunity for us to learn about mobilizing social movements during the pandemic. Now, allow me to introduce, I will start off with Ario Dare Atoye. He is a civil rights activist representing the Center of Liberty. Dare, are you with us? Yeah, very well, very well. You, Thank you're you very welcome. Much. Thank you. And the next person I'd like to introduce is Dudu Zile Nyirongo. She's an award-winning business leader and citizen activist. Welcome. Hello, how are you? Hi, Dudu, I'm very well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and would... Sorry? It's a pleasure. Thank it's a so. pleasure. Pleasure is all mine, Dudu. 
Then I'd also like to introduce Ruth, Ruth Mumby from Kenya, who's a women rights defender and campaigning against femicide. Ruth? Hello, everyone. Hi, Ruth. Um, just so you're wondering, Ruth at the moment is on, 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 a, on a go, on a transition, I believe. So that's the reason why we can't see her on video. But, you know, you can see her face so we can imagine how she looks like. Perhaps during the course of the discussion, she will be able to join us by video as well. But most importantly, you're here. Thank you for joining us, Ruth. Then we also have with us, last but not least, Mohamed Lamin Saidakan, who's representing Senegal and Gambia. He's an award-winning human rights activist and the movement coordinator of African Rising. Welcome, Mohamed. Thank you for having me, Rita. So let's dive straight in, starting with Dare, who will give us an insight about the situation in Nigeria. Now, before you carry on, Zare, um, I would like to mention to all our listeners today, please feel free to post your questions and comments in the Zoom Q&E box at the bottom of your screen or on the Facebook feed. So, now, Zare, the screen is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, let me especially commend uh, VIDC for putting this very important uh, seminar, call it lecture or conversation together, and also welcome our own delectable Rita Isiba, uh, Lisa and Irene, and without forgetting my boss, Mr. Franz and everyone. And I, I, I also want to appreciate uh, my panelists, uh, fellow panelists, um, for actually making it out for us to have this very robust conversation. My name is, and also to our attendees, that's talking about participants. Um, well, I also appreciate you this evening. My name is Ario Dare Atui. I'm from Ikiti State in Nigeria and a civil rights activist. Um, I, I belong to different organizations, Convener Center for Liberty, Convener Coalition in Defense of Nigerian Democracy and Constitution, Executive Director at Adult Group for Development Initiative. I've been involved in activism right uh, from my days in secondary school up to the university level and out of school. I've been involved, activism is part of me. Social movement is something that will remain evergreen, not just only in Nigeria, but in Africa, because there will always be problems to solve, there will be challenges. And the more they come, the more we have people organizing to actually tackle these challenges and address them, you know, irrespective of you know, the, the consequences sometimes because it could be very, really challenging. Um, it's, it's important that I, I say this, that this conference is coming at a time that uh, we have a major, major issue in Nigeria, which is the NSAT. And I, I'm sure the attendees want to know what is actually, uh, what, what is the meaning of SARS. That's S-A-R-S. That's to end, it's as in E-N-D, to end S-A-R-S. So to end SARS means, SARS means Special Anti-Robbery Squad. It was a, a group of uh, all police officers, a special squad put together by the Nigerian Police Authority to address the issue of criminality in Nigeria. But unfortunately, uh, the people who were saddled with the responsibility of addressing criminality have they themselves become you know, agents of criminality, thereby harassing Nigerians, and this has been on for years. So this conference, social um, movement in Africa, uh, mobilization in the, uh, in the middle of this pandemic that has ravaged the world, even though we have had uh, less of uh, the effect of it in Africa. So let me say first that it's, an, it's a good time for us to have this kind of conference, this kind of conversation. One, simply because for us to properly organize in Africa, there must be conversation. Before I go into the nitty gritty of what happened, I mean, the, the issue in Nigeria, the conversation we're having today is part of this, you know, organizing. Because one thing that this pandemic has given us is actually positive in a way for activists, for uh, CSO, civil society, society organization, non-governmental organization. For instance, through this um, conversation, I've been able to meet France, I've been able to meet Rita, I've been able to meet Lisa. Now, 
today we are having a very important conversation on how to do what we call mobilization. Now, what I have been advocating in Nigeria here is community of activists must come together and must have what we call a coalition. The only way we can successfully successfully prosecute social movement in Africa is for us to have coalition. And one thing the pandemic has done is for us to utilize the opportunity of some of these online conversations via Zoom and other platforms. We have had thousands, thousands of conferences and conversations since March 2020, and it's still ongoing. And so it has afforded us an opportunity for us to converse, but have we really been able to make use of this, to turn it around in such a way we can hold leadership accountable? Well, we can say significantly. That was why it was easy for Nigerians to mobilize for answer. Since 2016, Nigerians have been complaining that, look, the Nigerian government should address the issue of these security operatives who have become a thorn in the flesh of Nigeria. But they've never listened. And let me give you the timeline. On October 1 this year, a group of us came together and said, because October 1 represents the independent day of Nigeria, that's the day Nigerians secure independence in 1960. And we came out to protest and say, not yet independent. We are not, yes, we are independent from the colonial masters, but are we still independent economically, politically? We came out, we protested, the authorities came after us, but we succeeded because we had a protest around the diplomatic drives around US embassy, British embassy area. They came in their numbers, but we succeeded, we held our ground. Now, that was a launching part because that actually agitated the entire country. So on um, October 12, an incident happened, which was more or less in terms of timeline, the beginning of this SARS movement in Nigeria, when, you know, a, a young man was brutalized and manhandled. And this generated, because the video surfaced online, and this generated a lot of concern, you know, nationwide. And since that very day, even though we had incidents, very terrible incident where people have been killed in the past, but that very incident triggered a new consciousness because already the grant has, you know, been made wet right from October 1st when activists came together and told Nigerians that we have the right to protest, we have the right to mobilize. So right from October 12th, Nigerians started coming out. Up to yesterday, Nigerians have been protesting online and offline. And when we start, it was during this mobilization for answers that we realize that a lot of Nigerians have been killed. People came out, came up with their testimonies, complaints, you know, including cases in court, allegations, petitions there and there. And let me say, social movement has been an ongoing concern in Nigeria, right from independence, even before independence, including you know, youth organizations group holding colonial masters accountable right from independence to the leadership accountable. In the last 20 years in Nigeria, since 1999, there have been a very remarkable social movement. We have Occupy Nigeria. We have the anti-social media bill, uh, protests. We've had a lot of some of these, uh, 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 what do you call it, social movement concerning Nigeria. And all of these, for instance, we have issue of uh, say no to rape. We have the bring back our girls which was conducted when some girls were kidnapped in Nigeria. And we've been having this concern, and all of I have been involved in every of those protests, simply because we believe that we must continue to hold leadership accountable. Now, the essence of, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, sorry, Dari. Thank you very much for giving us an insight in what the situation is in Nigeria. <laughs> We will have towards the end of this discussion an opportunity for you to elaborate even more. We'd just like to give our next activists the chance also to illustrate what's happening in their countries. So I'll refer back to you again, Dare. Thank you so much. So um, to our dear listeners, can you relate to Dare? Feel free to state your questions in the Zoom Q&A chat box or in the comment section on, um, on Facebook. Now, I would like to welcome Dudu to tell her story. Dudu, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Rita. Okay, so uh, in Zimbabwe, um, the lockdown began um, around end of March. 
Uh, as we speak right now, we have about 8,900 cases and about 260 deaths. So the pandemic has not been that um, vicious as we've been seeing happening in other continents. Um, but then when the COVID happened, it exposed a lot of things. Uh, it meant, it showed us that um, public institutions for health uh, were not really stable. So um, it exposed um, people were not going to, people were not going to work and this is an informal sector. So already you can imagine what happens when people don't go to work. It's an informal sector and you're, stopped, you're told not to go anyway and you're leaving from hand to mouth. So situations began to be worse because you're sitting at home, you don't have food on your table, you don't know where you're gonna get your next meal because like over like 90% of our economy, they are unemployed. So that was the situation and our public health was exposed. The hospitals did not have ventilators. The hospitals did not have um, equipment, PPE. And people were questioning, is the government ready for COVID? So a lot of questions were being raised. The doctors went on strike, the nurses, and saying, we, we can't go to work in such a situation like this. Uh, how are we we're gonna be exposed? Please provide us with equipment. Please provide us with the necessary things. So you, there were strikes, health sector had a strike, and, and you know, the funds started coming in for COVID, and then uh, there were allegations of corruption uh, with regards to the funds for COVID. And people started to ask questions. Uh, what is happening with the money? You know, if the pandemic hits us hard, what is going to happen? So there were a lot of those questions and we started seeing a lot of organizing on social media uh, for, uh, which was called the 31 July protests. So we had um, political leaders organizing uh, Zimbabwean. So this really didn't have like a leader and people, it was going with the hashtag 31 July. So there was mobilization on WhatsApp, on Twitter, on Facebook, and people were like, let's, we're saying no to corruption. We're saying no to, to hunger. We're saying no to unemployment. Uh, you have to hear us. Don't use COVID as an excuse. So people wanted to be heard. So before those, um, before those, before the 31 July protests, we saw um, a journalists, award-winning journalists uh, like Hopo being arrested. We saw Jacob Garimbume, who was like the one who like initiated the 31 July protest was also arrested and then um, because the restrictions had eased then the government then said on those days we are shutting down because the cases are increasing so it went back to the first level of lockdown like the one we had in the 21st days uh, we saw the army restricting people from getting into into the central business district from going back to work and it was like a total shutdown in the city of Harare and other major cities as well so um, so the, the protest couldn't happen because you have your army, you have your police barricading everywhere and you cannot go anywhere. And those who did try to protest on that, that day were arrested. We have award-winning author Titi Tangareba who was arrested on that day. Uh, we have um, political uh, opposition uh, spokeswoman Fazai Mahere for the Movement for Democratic Change being arrested as well on that day. Um, so just a few hands that, that came out with being arrested because they're saying you cannot protest because of COVID. So people have been trying to protest, but the police just say because of COVID, you're now, you're now going against the COVID regulations. So you cannot protest. So those were blocked. But then after that, people went on Twitter and the hashtag uh, called Zimbabwean Lives Matter started trending. Um, and we had people from South Africa artists, music artists coming and asking, hey, what's with the Zimbabwean lives matter? What is happening? You know, the police brutality and all our journalists, our, our artists being arrest, arrested. So the hashtag really trended and we had people from artists from America asking what is happening? Because we'd like, like try and tag a lot of international people to see, hey, Look at what is happening in our country. We even had um, people like Hillary Clinton calling out, please 
release uh, so he released political prisoners release activists so and so so that is what was happening during the COVID era so it was a bit difficult to mobilize because the government is saying you cannot have public gatherings uh, you cannot have this so people were trying as much as possible to do it on online on social media and at least have other people hear us uh, unfortunately you know sad that uh, south africa sent in the convoy to come and see what is happening after zimbabwean lives matter um and then they went back uh, without anything that is tangible they went back to south africa and the south african delegate didn't even able to meet um the civil society they didn't meet they just met the government uh, the ruling party but they did not hear the other people's voices as well but at least it showed that this uh, social media was a really powerful effect because it had people from all over the world uh, looking onto Zimbabwe and say, hey, what is happening? You know, you even had a former president of Botswana uh, wearing uh, a t-shirt with the Zimbabwean Lives Matter, you know, saying, hey, look at what is happening in Zimbabwe. So that is what is happening, been happening during the COVID era. Thank you for giving us an insight what's happening in Zimbabwe, Dudu. I find it also very interesting that the government is using COVID as a screen to muffle the voices of activists. Um, we'll delve in a little bit deeper um, in what your involvement is. And uh, I would like to move on now to Ruth. We are really looking forward to you telling us what's happening in Kenya. Ruth, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much, and I'm so much humbled to be uh, uh, here uh, tonight, and also to share my thoughts and uh, uh, the situation, how it is in Kenya. Okay, Ruth, we can't hear you right now. I'll give you one moment. If you're not able to regain your network signal, just hello okay yes we can hear you now uh, yeah i'm saying it's a very it's a sad state it's a sad state of affair like any mm -hmm. other african government kenya has not been uh, kenya is not exceptional i want to share uh, one of the uh, a story or rather one of the uh, organizing that i've been part and puzzle of uh, in, uh, in uh, here in kenya after covid uh, uh, after after Okay, all we heard was after COVID and you've disappeared again. After we had the first case of COVID, uh, we realized uh, the Kenyan government had decided that uh, we, were, we, we were to go on a, a partial lockdown and uh, we went on a partial lockdown. And on the 4th of March, there was um, an eviction that happened in the middle of the pandemic in a village called Perobangi, where more than 5,000 people were evicted by the Kenyan government. And I remember during the evictions, it was a really sad state of an affair because that day it was really, really uh, raining. The weather was not even favorable. These people were not even given ample notice to vacate uh, in that land and also to put assault in the injury. This was a land that they have occupied for over 30 years. And it was not an illegal, uh, uh, an illegal occupation. They had the title deed. The government knew that they were there. The government also, uh, they, they also had provided even sanitation to these people. But at night at around 4 a.m., the bulldozers came. They started uh, bringing down the building and the houses. And the children and the women were the most affected people in, that, in, in, in the village. And because we were in a partial lockdown, there were people who were not, who had gone to the, to, to the village. So by the time the evictions were taking place, they had not gotten back to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Kariobangi. We also witnessed that there were uh, people, a majority of the people who are domestic workers, they had also lost livelihood because it happened on 4th of May and people who, who, who had rented houses in this uh, village had already paid rent. So it basically what it meant, because this is a village where majority of people who are living there 
they are poor they live from hand to mouth they live in less uh, they, they live in less than a dollar a day so they will not even afford to rent a, an alternative space so what we did as activists as community organizers because there was no that there wasn't a voice that was amplifying the struggles of these people. So I started sharing the stories, the stories as we were collecting them from this village on my social media with other activists, and people started knowing what was happening in Kariobangi. But I didn't know that whatever I was doing was uh, going to put us in, uh, in, dire, in dire risk. After sharing these stories, um, a majority of the people and uh, the well-wishers Majority of the people and our well wishers are dis uh, are decided that they are going to bail out our people because people started asking me because uh, you are sharing these stories they are very emotional what what can we do to help at that moment we didn't even have an idea if we can because uh, we have never worked in a humanitarian ground we we didn't have even an idea that uh, we would we, we will do humanitarian work so people started uh, saying that uh, we have these we can donate to these people so uh, 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 the stories I was sharing started creating a lot of attraction and people started even criticizing the government on my social um, social media pages and uh, through that um, a person who posed to be a police officer stationed in one of the police stations here in Karobangi uh, wrote a, a text message uh, uh, threatening me that if I continue talking and sharing anything uh, concerning Kariobangi, they are going to, uh, to make me disappear. After that, uh, the people we were, the, the activists that I was also uh, working closely with, they, were, uh, they started also receiving threats. So we continued, we didn't stop uh, 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 helping uh, the Kariobangi people. So while we, we, while we started documentation, we did uh, reach out to other partners who had capacity to help this uh, community to seek justice and through uh, organizations human rights organizations like the kenya human rights commission they came on board and they helped us do a proper documentation that can that can help this community file a lawsuit in court to to, uh, to demand justice because uh, the evictions were illegal but uh, since then because of the advocacy that i have been running it uh, has not been easy because uh, we also came to realize that uh, the evictions were sanctioned by African Development Bank that uh, is funding our, our government to do a sanitation uh, uh, program in Kariobangi. So for us, uh, uh, um, what I can say, what I have learned about, uh, 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 about the work of community organizers, and especially during this time of COVID, majority of uh, organizers and human rights defenders they never stopped even working. Uh, and I'm talking basically uh, about uh, uh, grassroots who, uh, uh, human rights defenders who continue doing the work that they do most, that they love to do, and who, who continue to work without even resources, who continue even to work with it, uh, without even donor funding. They continued doing the work and they became a bridge. They became a pillar of support to the community that they represent. Because I remember during after 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 even like uh, uh, two months of COVID, uh, during the State of the Nation, our president uh, um, said that they were going to bail out the hospitality industries. Uh, it's so sad that uh, we have a government that does not think about uh, the masses, that does not think about domestic workers, that does not think about the informal uh, workers. So as uh, activists, we also, uh, we, 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 never, we never even, we forgot about the threats that we were receiving and we decided to organize a march in solidarity and mobilize domestic women workers to go de demand from our government that they also need to be cushioned because they're also in hospitality industry. But uh, the protests we were dispersed, the government used a lot of force towards our women. Later on, there was this uh, mismanagement of COVID a grant that was granted by the Kenyan government. So um, the movement here in Kenya organized a protest demanding, uh, uh, demanding 
to stop the thieves who were stealing uh, uh, COVID money from the foreign government. And through that, I was part of the I was part of the organizers, and I was also part of the people who were arrested for for going out on the street to demand the government to arrest. All, uh, all state officers that had stolen uh, COVID money. So it, it hasn't been easy. The government has been taking advantage of COVID. And just recently, <laughs> it's unfortunate that they are borrowing uh, tactics uh, from other African governments. Just recently, our president has formed a special force uh, or a special unit that's going to deal with citizens who don't abide by the medical the Ministry of Health uh, protocols. If you are, if uh, if you are, you are not wearing a mask, if you are not, uh, if you are, you are, you are, you are in a in a group of uh, more than uh, 15 people, there is that a special unit that comprises of uh, uh, of uh, military and also police and also the the, the city the city council police. So mm -hmm. as actually. Ruth, we have to, sorry, have to interrupt you here. Uh, you, you're sharing with us a very chilling but also inspirational story. I would like to learn more about it uh, later during our discussion today. Um, I would like to move on, however, to Mohamed Lamed Saidikan, who is sitting either in Senegal or Gambia. I'm not too sure. Mohamed, the screen is yours. Thank you, Arita. Hello, everybody. Good uh, evening from Senegal. I'm a Gambian, <laughs> so uh, I can talk about both of them, but also I work at Pan African level at Africans Rising for Justice, Peace, and Dignity as one of the movement coordinators uh, for this great movement. Um, uh, I, will start stay, I will start by saying that COVID 19 came with its own realities, but the realities are different, especially for Africa and for us as movement leaders and movement um, facilitators across the continent. As we speak, um, Senegal recorded more than 15,000 cases, 15,800, over 15,800 cases of COVID-19 um, with over 3,000 deaths and all of that. And then um, the Gambia recorded over 3,000 deaths, just to give you a sample of uh, 3,000 uh, cases. That is just to give samples of um, COVID-19 cases um, in Senegal and Gambia. Um, as I said, um, Africa and itself, cases of organizing in terms of COVID is very much um, critical, it's very much um, difficult, it becomes very hard for the lives of activists. Um, African governments have been very good with surveillance in terms of how activists are responding to the injustices, the corruption practices, and the impunity that they put on the people. So the COVID-19 cases have really um, brought a lot of challenges to African um, organizers and civil society movements uh, that are leading change across the continent. We are left with few choices of organizing, choices of being only online, where our governments have put a lot of investment into following and cracking down activists and organizers. So um, the critical point is, you know, how have COVID-19 changed powers? COVID-19 actually have unveiled and have exposed the, the challenges of Africa, especially the incapability of Africa responding to quality healthcare. And this becomes an opportunity for all of us as activists and organizers to really work together to hold governments accountable in delivering healthcare. So as Africans rising, our membership coming from trade unions, faith-based groups, uh, grassroots movements, um, all the different civil society formations, youth movement, women movements, um, women, people living with disability and all of that, you know, coming together to initiate a campaign called Rise for Our Lives, that we need to rise for our lives to hold governments accountable 
in delivering quality healthcare, especially during the time of uh, COVID-19. So around May 2020, we have mobilized across Africa to really um, hold governments accountable in terms of where the COVID money is going, holding them accountable to ensure that they restructure their budgets and respond to COVID-19 using our own resources. We call it Africa for Africans, uh, governments for governments, like government for people, they need to respond to the needs of the people by reprioritizing the budget. So holding a lot of governments accountable. Again, we hold governments accountable in our Rise for Life campaign um, by asking African governments to spend the money or holding them accountable in terms of how they spend the money. So we run a campaign around follow the money. So activists on the ground in all the different countries following the money, um, you know, ensuring that they are tracking how this COVID-19 money uh, is spent. A lot of African governments have also used COVID-19 as an opportunity to borrow more loans, you know, to take more grants, to enrich themselves as much. So the campaign have been trying to hold them accountable. Again, um, COVID-19 in itself came with um, a lot of um, realities around the exposing how bad it is our prison conditions. We all know, uh, many of us will know that um, African activists have been narrated by my comrades here, have been targets for African governments and journalists have been targets for African governments and they have been incarcerated for no reason, for just raising their voice against injustices. And myself, I've been in the front line of this, I've tested my time in, 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 in all of these prisons and jails in taking a lot of brutality from the police as we fight for a fight against dictatorship in Gambia and uh, across Africa. So uh, a lot of our comrades are serving prison terms right now without um, justice. So, and then the prison conditions are not really convenient for, for these activists. So what we are, what we, what we, the other thing that we did is to run a campaign called Freedom, where we're asking African governments to free political prisoners and activists to decongest prisons in order to cope the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is, um, um, have been a rigorous and uh, progressive and ag aggressive uh, advocacy and campaign against African government. We wrote to all African leaders, head of states, uh, for them to release. Some there have been some response, about 81,000 prisoners have been released across the continent from 32 countries. South Africa have been the, 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 the high, with the highest number of 18,000 prisoners been released. Um, but this campaign is actually continuing because the prison conditions in Africa is too terrible. And then a lot of countries have reported cases of COVID-19 pandemic virus in the, in the prisons. Again, um, um, during the whole pandemic, you know, as, as Africans have worked on the lives of black life, black people, whenever the black people are attacked or under attack, Africans have been respond to Africans in crisis. So when George Floyd was killed in the US, um, there have been a rise of movements across the, con the continent and also um, more in, in the US. So in, in response to that, Africans Rising organized um, a campaign around digging into what we call, um, you know, want to know the root cause of, or re reaffirm the root cause of racism. So we started a campaign called Rewrite History, where we are trying to hold all the you know, former colonial masters accountable for the atrocities that they have caused on Africans and in Africa. So the right, the right history campaign have been sending letters to former colonial masters, asking them to cancel debts that Africa own. Again, or to them. Again, we are asking them to reparate. Again, we are asking them to apologize to African people for all the atrocities. And then again, we are asking them to reconcile and start a process of healing. So last week, our team and allies in the US, UK have climbed on top of the, um, the UK parliament and hung over our um, very powerful and demanding letter to the people of the UK. So all of these things are, are things that um, Africans Rising have been doing in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. But the realities are, are, are clear. A lot of governments have used COVID-19 as an avenue to violate 
the rules to violate the laws of the countries. We have seen in Guinea Conakry, where a lot of our comrades have been killed, government has brutally um, violated the constitution, what I call constitutional coup d'etat, changing the constitution to allow the president to run, and a lot of people have been killed along this process. And then uh, solo election have also been, uh, election have also been done, president claiming to be the winner. Again, similar things have, been, have happened in um, Ivory Coast, where presidents who have agreed to two term limits in the ECOWAS are now brutally changing constitutions to allow them to run for, for several times. As we speak today, eight people were killed in Uganda in an election, pro in, in an election process where presidents are killing and the security forces in under governments are killing activists, are killing civilians, civil society leaders, activists and movement leaders who have raised their voice against injustices, who have raised their voice for democracy, have been brutally murdered on the streets of, um, of, 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 of our motherland in, in different parts of uh, Africa. Mohammed, um, it seems like the list is almost endless. Out of the 55 countries, I wonder which countries are at least running their government as fairly as possible without using and uh, abusing uh, the corona lockdown uh, to violate people's rights. Um, I'd like to learn more, and I'm pretty sure our listeners as well. Um, but for now, I'd like to take uh, some questions. Uh, I'd like to ask some of the questions that have already been posted on Facebook and um, in the Q&A box here on Zoom. But I would also like to uh, provide our listeners an opportunity to raise your hand and voice your own questions. So what I mean by that is that by simply raising your hands, uh, one of my colleagues um, who's working feverishly at the back ground, on the background, uh, she would uh, help me select someone who is willing to voice their own questions. And um, so before we carry on with that, I will take some of the questions which I have picked up on. Now, uh, Julia Manik, she has a question for Dare. Now, how did people overcome this moment of fear of infection and repression that should force them to stay where they live, she asks. She asked, did so many people mobilize at the same time so they couldn't stop them? Are there any conspiration, conspiracy, yeah, conspiracy theories around COVID that weaken the social movement? This is a question posed to you, Dari, from Julia Manik. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, yeah, in Africa, in Nigeria, without exception, there have been conspiracy theories about COVID. But actually what, uh, in a way, uh, made people to come out uh, during protests. And let me say, since we started our lockdown in Nigeria, I think around April, we've had uh, about three to four protests. We've had uh, the end rape uh, protests. We've had uh, the October 1 protest, the end says, you know, protests. So, uh, people, you see, because of the endemic nature of uh, corruption, which has led to hunger and poverty in Africa and Nigeria, Nigeria is currently the uh, global capital of extreme poverty. And the lockdown that was induced, you know, um, that, I mean, the lockdown that happened as a result of COVID actually led to a lot of sufferings among the people. And there is this thing among Africans that look, they can't see this disease, they can't see why government is asking them to stay at home, so they can't see the enemy. So for, for people to say there's a virus and you cannot go out, some people cannot just understand. And after a while, the government also lacked the capacity to be able to meet the need of the people in terms of uh, safety nets, like providing palliatives. For instance, you could see what happened during the NSAS protest that Nigerians suddenly discovered that some palliatives, you know, were stashed somewhere by government in warehouses all over the country. And that was part of the thing that further fueled the, the negative aspect of that uh, nationwide protest when people started going from warehouses to warehouses, you know, to actually collect what belonged to them because those things were stored. But the politicians wanted to use them for political purposes you know, now some of those things have been bought since April, April this year, they were not distributed. Some of them since July, they were not distributed. So, you know, this 
kind of hunger led the people to rebel against COVID. I want to say that if we do sufficient testing in Africa, we will definitely have triple of the number that we currently have in Africa, definitely. But again, there is also another thing which is also very important. I think Africa, while the Europeans and Americans and other parts of the world believe that they have to go through science, a lot of Africans believe that they can always look for ingenuity. So instead of, you know, people sometimes listen to the science, people look at local remedies, some of the things that, you know, people can use to address COVID. And a lot of people, you know, like um, garlic, ginger, all manner of things that people were saying, people were still using them, including chloroquine. So mm. the government lack of capacity the people's ingenuity in quotes to actually looking for remedy and the fact that people are tired, you know, for you to lock people down, no food, and a lot of Africans and Nigerians live from hand to mouth on daily income. So it's going to be difficult without an alternative. So in answering um, the question, what led to people to come out was because of largely economic you know, reason, the, cap uh, the lack of capacity of the, Afri of the Nigerian government to address this. And also, during this period, a lot of activists have been able to, com to communicate together through Zoom like this conference. So there have been that bond, and that's what allowed us to have what we call some of the efficient and successful protests that you've seen. So while COVID is bad, you know, the period of the lockdown that some of us have to comply with has also allowed to have meeting of the minds and for us to have conversation. And also that actually also strengthened the NSAS, you know, protest because in addition to that, the university has been on strike in Nigeria for about eight months. So I'll have to stop you there, Darius. Sorry, my sincere apologies for, for due to time constraints. I would have to ask all of you to keep your answers very short. Um, I would like to take one of the comments that was placed on Facebook anonymously. Uh, they, uh, this person has posted the Nigerian government fears accountability. True? Lie? We don't know. Very um, true, very true. <laughs> I hear you. Now, this next question is for Dudu. Dudu, the question is, people meet and, uh, at protests on social media, but if I can broaden the discussion, does this mean that the protests lose their initial character, which is to prevent harsh regulations? Is social media protesting enough? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Social media is uh, is not enough. Um, uh, we need more than social media. We need to go on the ground uh, because um, social media just reaches out to a few people in uh, in our country. Because most are not on Twitter, most are not on Facebook, uh, most maybe on WhatsApp. But many people do not really have access to internet. So social media is not really, really effective and it's only for those that really have access. Grassroots mobilization would be the thing that is more effective. Yeah. Thank you very much for your quick answer. I've got another question for Muhammad Lamin. This is from Anja Ringhofer. She asks, how is Adama Barrow doing regarding corruption and accountability with COVID money? I've not seen much about what Barrow is doing um, uh, with regards to COVID-19 money. I will say that the, there is a big frustration in the government of Barrow about corruption of, um, of, uh, related to the COVID-19 money. Recently, about two months ago, three months ago, the Minister, of, um, the Minister of Health was in Parliament crying, crying baby in, or crying for accountability of the COVID-19 money. He said, Corruption in the top um, uh, offices is really undermining the response, government's response to COVID. Again, recently, last week, um, health workers, frontline health workers have been on strike on demonstration for payment of COVID-19. Um, we have seen government buying a lot of vehicles. There is no accountability uh, with regards to COVID money, but activists have been following the money. Thank you very much. I don't know whether that's sad or we have to actually start a new protest just because of this reason. Uh, I will take another comment and then we move on to the panel discussion. This comment is from Marsha Mallow. Thank you so much for the presentations. They were all insightful. I hope that the grassroots movements will lead to positive change. Bravo to all of you. 
Now let's move on to uh, our next session, uh, in which I would like to ask you some relevant questions. But before we do that, I would like uh, to prompt our listeners today to complete a very short survey. We have a very short survey which will not take you longer than a minute or two, but it will help us to improve and design this dialogue, the VIDC Global Dialogue, to your liking. Let me show you how short it is. I will try and share you my screen. If you just bear with me one moment, let's see. Okay. So I hope you guys can see my screen. Uh, but you can also see other windows. But this is how short it is. There's only a few questions. It won't take you more than a minute, but it's, it, it's valuable for us to make sure that we create an event that is exactly to your liking, as insightful and informative as possible. So let's move on now. Uh, that being said, I would like us to now just have a quick chat uh, about the, the situation relevant in your country. So I'll start with you, Dare. You already mentioned to us the situation in Nigeria, the end SARS protest, what end SARS stands for. Now, I was wondering, it seems the so-called feminist coalition played an important role. What were women doing? Were they at the forefront of these protests? Very well, thank you very much for this beautiful question. Very well, a lot of women um, activists played prominent roles, including some very young uh, ladies that we've never seen before in the course of activism. activism. Uh, that was why I said in this guise that this pandemic has also, you know, uh, enabled a lot of conversation and a lot of people have been well oriented. So the feminist call actually contributed a lot. They were able to raise money and uh, they were able to get support of other feminist groups uh, um, internationally. And you, know, you have to also give it to them, you know, in terms of coordination and support, uh, uh, medics, uh, money for food and they have, so they, they got both local and uh, international support and they actually also made this money very open they were transparent and accountable actually in the cost of distributing and sharing money Rita your mic is off it's smooth Thank you very much for reminding me to put the mute, the microphone on. I would like to move my next question to Ruth, but before we do that, I would also like to encourage you, fellow listeners, to post your questions either on Facebook or on the Q, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you like, you, if you raise your hand towards the Q&A session, you can voice your own questions as well. And towards the end of this discussion, or should I even say after the discussion, our activists are also open to take some of your questions as well, because we realize that this topic is very grand and we are on strict time constraint. So now, Ruth, I have a very interesting question for you here as well. How can we in Austria and the African diaspora help to realize the course you pursue? Ruth, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Rita. And thank you so much for that question because I think it's a very powerful question because uh, uh, <laughs> what we've been uh, trying to do as a movement, as a people who have been affected by so much injustices uh, and especially by the corporations that have been extracting a lot of from uh, Africa and especially from Kenya, uh, we've, uh, we, we've been trying to create partnership and create solidarity. So what I would request from uh, people from Austria, what you can do, uh, you, can, you, can, you, you can stand in solidarity with us and also endorse the, the work that you have been doing, amplify our struggle. And especially I would really appeal if you, uh, if 
people listening me from uh, listening uh, uh, me from Austria, if you can stand in solidarity uh, with the people who are affected by the evictions uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, I would really appreciate. You can tweet. You can you can write um, uh, um, messages and especially letters to African Development Bank and the Kenyan government demanding justice for the Karyobangi people because uh, they are still giving us a blind eye even though we are going to court to uh, to to compel the government to compensate uh, uh, the Karyobangi uh, people because you can't evict more than more than five thousand people mm -hmm. from the land that they have known a uh, home. And, and uh, when and I evict them during um, a pandemic that uh, need a lot of uh, uh, care, uh, people to stay at home. No, that's not right. So stand in solidarity with us and write uh, letters of appeal and uh, also tweet hashtag justice for Karyobangi. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Dudu, you yeah. mentioned one of the arrested protesters was the award-winning Zimbabwean author, Tsitsi Gangrawengba. What role does the artist play in the nonviolent protest? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, the artists amplify the voices because artists are people that um, relate to the majority of the people. So when an artist speaks, uh, people listen. Uh, the voices are amplified because they have a wide audience people that adore them, people that listen to them. So the, art, the role of artists is very, very important. Uh, we've seen Zimbabweans calling for artists to speak out. Musicians, please speak out, uh, help us with the cause. Your voice is very important. If you speak out, um, uh, probably the government will listen. If you speak out, you reach out to many of your fans, many of your supporters, people who adore you, so you've got a larger audience and, and maybe when you speak out, people can join you because people usually relate, want to do what their, their artists are doing, their cele celebrities, you call them, mm -hmm. they're doing. So people usually tend to follow the celebrities. So if a celebrity speaks out, that would really help because um, pe uh, people will tend to follow what they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, voice of artists really amplify the struggle, really amplifies um, our, uh, the movement's uh, cause, cause of concern, what we're really fighting for. So if those artists can speak out and if people that follow them can say, oh, but this person is really also affected by this uh, situation. Uh, it's not really affecting me only, but it's also affecting him as well. So we are like one. So they can also unite people as well because they got people from diverse uh, uh, backgrounds that are supporting them. Thank you very much for that. I hope we have one or two celebrities who are online right now or even influencers with a large following that could actually post this discussion and also amplify your voices uh, on, on, on the advocacy that you are all carrying out. Now, Muhammad, nonviolent protests can be a powerful method to trigger change and relations between states and citizens. Yet many social movements remain vulnerable to brutal military interventions and elite interests. Now, can you share with us some concrete practices of movement coordinations and mobilizing mechanisms? Thank you so much. That's an interesting one. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, um, our governments and systems have been meant to enrich the, the, those in power and they use the military and security forces to brutalize organizers and movements. So, but there are a few things that they fear that we need to know as organizers and that we need to use effectively. One of them is numbers. We, are, um, the movement organizing need to be very good with numbers, to mobilize numbers, use effective use of uh, innovation and critical way of doing actions. Um, and then being very courageous in, 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 in the actions. One thing that I also understand that the oppressors and governments very much critically fear is media. So how do we effectively use media 
is very important and very critical because if you really want to mobilize people, really want to have numbers, you need to inform them and educate them about the challenges or the cause that you are working on. If I don't know the pain that you are facing or faced with, I will not be able to work with you in solidarity. So one of the things that Africans Rising do effectively and that we encourage movements across the continent to do effectively and in communities in countries is to connect our issues together, to connect the struggles together, to amplify the struggles together, to create those numbers that to create and be able to use that power to influence change. Our governments either listen to numbers or they are kicked out by numbers. We have seen what happened in Mali. The military came and took over the space, but the protesters would have, would have gone out there and kicked out that um, corrupt leader. Again, in Burkina Faso, it has been tested, movements coming together, great numbers, and kick out a brutal dictator. In Gambia, where I was in the front line of dictatorship, we used different tactics and tools, using brooms to sweep the president out, symbols of traditional tools to, for the president to move out, symbols of a kalama, that is a local spoon of uh, signifying that leadership is about you know, exchange. When you drink water, you need to give the spoon to another person to drink. So using of all the different innovative tactics and tools, having the confidence and belief in yourself that this president and leadership need to be your servants. So we have to hold them accountable. If not, we will live in, um, in poverty. We will not enjoy the life of a dignified life that we set to enjoy as citizens of a nation. So coming together, mobilizing numbers and pushing harder is the way forward. Thank you, Muhammad. Dari, how can you relate to Muhammad's ta tactics and mechanism of mobilizing movements? Can you give us some practical um, advice in what we can do either from Austria or also for those of you in different parts of the world that has experienced similar? Can you give us some advice? Well, thank you very much. We did something on October 1, and which was uh, the day we said not to independent. We knew that the government was going to stop us uh, from assembling, from protesting. So what we did was, I think we've done this like on two, three occasions. Mm -hmm. um, we told them that we're going to have, even though we knew where we're going to have this protest, um, and that we're going to give out information strategically to uh, different organizations and individuals that will be participating. So we, we use, you know, half radar means of communicating and telling them that we're going to give them this information last minute on that day. So we told the government that we're going to have protests in six locations in Abuja. So what the government did was to deploy soldiers to all these, I mean, police uh, men and women to these locations. And also they brought out uh, police patrol vehicle patrolling the city. But we were able to beat them to it. Well, we, we eventually had those protests along the diplomatic drive. Our intention was to march from there to uh, the UN, but because they came around, but one thing that we succeeded in holding those protests, what Mohammed said is also very symbolic. We, a symbolic way of making government to realize that, look, um, you, the game is up in terms of impunity. Before the NSAS started major protests, we went to the police headquarters we got blood from abattoir and we use it to write NSAS in front of police station. Because these NSAS, we've also been doing um, what you call NSAS uh, uh, graffiti in different parts of the city center to continue to remind them that look, we need to put an end to impunity. And let me also say this, in what I told uh, the New York Times a few days ago, I said, you never can tell what is going to trigger another protest. And that was exactly why I told the New York, because it's a matter of when and not if, before Nigerians and Africa re record more uprising and mean social economic dislocations uh, that is compounded by the coronavirus pandemic, and which is now still spinning into economic chaos. And if we have done a bit of due diligence, we've realized that um, some economic group have, have, have actually told us that, you know, if we, if, we had, if we had done due diligence, they actually told us that, look, this situation was going to come. For instance, in Campbell of uh, various uh, Marco Crofts uh, in a report on uh, July 16, 2021, that as the economic fallout from COVID-19 mounts, protests in emerging and frontier markets are set to swell with millions of newly employed, underpaid, underfed citizens posing a risk to domestic stability 
with few parallels in recent decades. And Nigeria was mentioned as one of the countries where, and some of us didn't see this report, and eventually that's exactly what we've been witnessing. So one thing that Mohammed has also said, which um, the Vienna Institute, which your institute, the VIDC, can help us to do as an organization for cooperation and dialogue can help us to do is to continue to strengthen the bond of conversation across different, uh, across activists and CSOs for us to be able, to, you know, to have a broader coalition, not just in-country coalition, but, you know, regional-wide coalition, because the numbers is what actually matters. If you have the numbers, there is no way uh, these dictators or the emerging dictators in Africa will be able to confront the number of people who are willing and able to defend their rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. I um, really enjoy the fact that you have given us a concrete example that we can actually apply. Uh, I hope today's conversation is one that does this, which is to amplify exactly what you're all doing and also to assist to bring on change. Uh, now, a question to Ruth. I understand that you have been very, very, um, should I say, involved in the advocacy of against femicide. Um, can you tell us more about this? What's the situation in Kenya? Ruth, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. I was unmuting my mic. Um, no problem. Yeah. Um, Yes, the situation in Kenya, uh, we have been losing a lot of uh, young women and young girls who have been killed by the people who are close to them, people that they know, boyfriends, people close to them. And our, 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 converse, our conversation, we brought the, uh, uh, the femicide conversation uh, in 2018 uh, when a university student was killed uh, by a sitting governor because of whom, whom she was dating. And the governor decided to kill this young woman because she had a lot of information on, on how she, uh, they were mishandling um, uh, uh, resources in that county government. And uh, uh, Sharon's case was not an exceptional case, but uh, the way she was killed, it was a very gruesome murder because she was uh, seven months pregnant. She was killed together with her unborn baby. So for us, uh, the, the people were not talking about uh, Sharon death. Even uh, uh, and it was not the first death that was uh, occurring and uh, being reported by the national uh, uh, media. So as a grassroots uh, feminist and a grassroots uh, um, uh, activist, we decided no, uh, we cannot allow and we cannot shut up and we cannot keep quiet when young women and young men and young women and uh, young girls are losing their life. Uh, uh, in the hands of men. So we, 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 we protested, we organized a very uh, a coordinated a protest in Nairobi to demand justice for Sharon, the university student. So since then, after we brought this conversation and, uh, and uh, now the mainstream uh, civil society saw that uh, this conversation were being taken by the grassroots, so they had to uh, join on board. It has not also been easy because uh, up to date, uh, we have this politics that uh, uh, the femicide is yet to be recognized. One of the advocacy that we have been running is to demand the government to recognize femicide as a standalone because it's still classified as, as a homicide. And uh, we have been demanding uh, and uh, also pressuring uh, the president to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make femicide a national a national, um, a national situation or rather disaster, which uh, the president affirmed, and he said that uh, women and girls have also right to live, and uh, he said that um, uh, he said that he was go the, the government will form a unit uh, to deal on gender, uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence, but it's still unfortunate, and especially uh, in this time of uh, COVID, we have uh, re uh, we have uh, been see we have uh, seen uh, uh, cases, arising uh, cases of uh, sexual and gender-based uh, violence, but uh, we are still uh, soldiering on in amplifying and standing in solidarity and also offering also moral support to the families that have been affected by the fem by femicide in Kenya. Thank you very much, Ruth, for giving us an insight about the situation in Kenya. I would like to ask Dudu, can you relate to what's happening in Kenya as well? 
is Zimbabwe also trying to fight the disease or should I say the um, unfortunate disaster of femicide? Um, yeah, we, we, we can relate to it. Um, um, we can't see you, unfortunately. So it's oh. interrupt you there. There we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So Zimbabwe, um, we haven't really been seeing a lot of, uh, femicide in Zimbabwe, uh, like in, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a quite a bit different situation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good news. <laughs> I've got one more question for Ruth, actually. Uh, this one is from Johannes Kaup, who's an Austrian journalist. He asks you regarding uh, the eviction of people in Karobangi. Now, the question is, has this event been monitored by the public media? And if yes, did that influence the politics? And if no, what is the role of public media in your home country? What are the media sources that activists can use and rely upon? Okay, thank you so much for that question. But before I answer that question, I'll, uh, I'll share a brief uh, a situation how it was that day. Uh, when uh, we went to the ground in Karobangi and real uh, and so what was happening and the media was not uh, there the media was not even reporting on, on the situation of uh, Karobangi so what uh, we did because uh, we believe that uh, uh, human uh, uh, that the power of uh, media we believe that uh, uh, amplifying this these cases and also exposing what was happening was uh, vital but we didn't have that power so what we did we called one of uh, one, one activist who has a huge following and he's a, a renowned activist Bonface Mwangi to come on the ground and what Bonface did he did a live tweet in, uh, in, in the area saying what was happening in Karobangi. Within a few minutes, it was uh, retweeted, it was viewed by, uh, uh, by many over, 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 over 800 people. So it shaped the entire conversation and the Kenyan media that had given uh, that blackout, but uh, we also understand them because uh, 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 our media has also been censured. And, uh, they, they, they were forced uh, to to air and also show what uh, the real situation was happening in Karyobangi. And about if we have alternative media as activists, yes, uh, uh, we do have community uh, radio stations and FM stations, but some uh, which are not uh, well funded and, uh, and uh, still they don't have a, a larger audience uh, as compared to the uh, capitalistic media houses that we have in the country. And did, uh, did it shift uh, the political, did, it, uh, did the Karobangi case shift uh, politics in, uh, in Kenya? Yes, it did, because at the moment we are in a crisis whereby uh, the current regime is trying to uh, trying to, to change our constitution. And the narrative was, if, uh, if uh, people, people started uh, questioning why, 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 why uh, change the constitution now, is that the constitution change a priority mm -hmm. uh, unlike, the, uh, unlike uh, the right to housing of, them, of uh, the 5,000 people that you have evicted? And also people started even questioning and also doubting whether uh, really we have uh, the crisis of COVID. So it really changed. Uh, the entire, we shifted the entire conversation and people started questioning the government on how they can evict uh, people in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. All right. I hope this answers the question for Johannes. I clearly can relate to your actions and uh, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Now, I would like to take some questions, but before I do that, may I also remind you to complete our brief survey, as I showed earlier. It won't take you longer than one or two minutes to complete. It will be very useful for you to complete this because in this way, we can design these sort of discussions like we're holding today, according to your liking. 
now I'm ready to take some questions. Some of them are posted on Facebook, others in our Q&A box here on Zoom. But if you'd also like to voice your question, I ask you to raise your hand and uh, I will invite you in. It may, there may be a slight delay, but um, we want to make this as interactive as possible. Before I do that, let me take a question from a lady called Irene Stock. Now, this question is applied to any speaker, so I would like to also encourage either Mohammed or Dari to answer this. Have you had the opportunity to connect with other movements for similar issues in other African countries? And is it safe to do so? And if yes, did it have an impact on how you organize yourself? So can I ask Dari to start off and then Mohamed? So thank you very much again, um, um, Rita, and also to the person who asked the question. Let me say that, yes, indeed, we have been networking and trying to uh, build coalition. And, and I'm, I'm sure Mohamed will speak likely to that because some of our comrades have also been having a meeting uh, with Mohamed uh, through the African rising. We've, is the one thing that, like I said, this pandemic, one opportunity has provided is an opportunity for us to actually meet off radar. When CSOs and activists are going out of the country, most times they are being monitored by secret uh, police, um, secret uh, uh, state police, and sometimes they want to know what you're going to do. But during this pandemic, where the government itself is facing a lot of uh, challenges, it has afforded, you know, activists, CSOs to be able to, you know, have a lot of meetings through Zooms, through different other platforms, you know, to network online. We believe that this will continue to increase as time goes on, simply because this meeting and conversation, you know, are still ongoing and the relationship, you know, are far extending and the networking is actually expanding. So, the, the, the COVID thing has helped us to network for that, and we're actually key on that. A lot of African countries, activists, regional wide supported NSAS movement, a lot of them participated, you know, in their own way online, you know. So one thing we have seen is that when things happen in one African country, and it's a sort of a social concern, you see activists in different other parts of the continent actually support it. I believe that by the time there is now opportunity for people to travel, there will be a lot of networking that will definitely going to happen. And lastly, let me say this, it's also very important that, you know, through VIDC, that we are able to do what we call um, a sort of a civic space situation room, which I think I would suggest to VIDC, civic data lab, and also to also for us to have new activist uh, manual for coalition building. And I think we can work this together with Mohammed for us to have a manual, you know, for young activists, which for us we saw during the NSAS protests in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dara Mohammed, to you. Yeah, I think that's why we, we, we exist as Africans Rising, is to connect, mm -hmm. amplify, and um, um, advance the struggles of social movement. So I will say yes, uh, we just what we do everywhere on the continent. Um, but it comes with its own pain and realities um, connecting around. So I, I, want, I want to say that governments, as I said in the beginning, have invested a lot of money into surveillance of activists and what they do. They see activists and movements as a bigger threat because they fear the truth, they fear accountability, and they fear to take responsibility to deliver what they need to deliver on the African continent for the people. So there have been a lot of uh, investment. So activists everywhere, aggressive and progressive activists have been seriously monitored everywhere. And it makes connection very difficult. Um, I, I will give an example of myself being arrested in, in Togo, because Africans have um, committed to responding to activists and movements and people who are in crisis, wherever they, it happens. So we do what we call solidarity missions to countries where we work with activists, work with all the different players to ensure that they're able to advance their agenda. So when I was in Kenya, I saw in, in Togo uh, in 2018, I got arrested. I, I got the arrest of my life in a foreign country where uh, the security forces were monitoring us. They put us into a lot of um, uh, serious conditions. So um, the connection, the amplification of movements should not 
be undermined by the threats of the security forces. That's why it is critical for us as Africans rising and other movement players and players like yours, um, um, the Vienna Institute for uh, International Dialogue and Cooperation to work together to help increase, increase the safety of activists by doing digital security trainings, by providing some gadgets possible for activists and critical organizers to be safe online. Um, the, the pandemic has shown us that there need to be more investment into the space of safety for organizers and for activists because government have already invested a lot of money into holding us um, at ransom all the time. African Zion have been putting a lot of money and energy into this process um, to, to enable connection because without connection, we will not be able to bring numbers and without connection, we will not be able to create the power to be able to challenge the brutal power that, is, that have been leading and ruling us for quite long. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you, Ruth. Also, thank you very much, Dudu, and you, Dare. A stiff salute to our invited speakers today. Wherever you are, I hope your actions and their actions inspire you to reshape power structures within our communities and our societies during, but also after the pandemic. Uh, you know, we live in interesting times. So, in case you missed some parts of the discussion, do not despair. The VIDC Dream Team will create a report which will be available on the VIDC.org website. And you're also, um, you also have a chance to access the recording of this online discussion on YouTube, also on Facebook. So if this discussion resonated with you, stay tuned for future events brought to you by the Vienna Institute of International Dialogue and Cooperation. And also to all of the French speakers out there, we do also realize that they, you know, the Africa doesn't just constitute of English speakers, but French speakers as well. The VIDC is also creating an event focusing on the Francophone um, region of Africa similar to this topic as well. So stay tuned on the date in the near future. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you would like to take, um, if you'd like to take some more questions, dear speakers and activists, we also have uh, some of the listeners that will stay behind and uh, ask some questions as well. This will be rather working um, offline Facebook, but online for those that are on Zoom. And uh, Again, I really look forward to seeing you all again for our next event. Hopefully it would be face to face. Please stay safe. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye from my end. Oh.